So this is about special functions. You can call this geometry and ordinary differential equations. Here are some references. So we're interested in this ODE. F is a function of X, let's say. Even for the simplest function, where P is zero and Q is one, we get complex roots for the characteristic polynomial. So it's convenient to allow complex variables, even if you were only interested in real variables. We classify ODEs by the number of Fuchsian regular singularities, which means P is no worse than one over Z, and Q is no more singular than one over Z squared. If you have one Fuchsian singularity, the equation is trivial, as discussed here. If you have two, it's also trivial because it can be brought to euler cauchy form that can be transformed to constant coefficients. So the sweet spot is three. It's called hypergeometric. It captures most ODEs found in basic mathematical physics, at least. Four is also non-trivial. It's not so popular. It's called the Hoyne equation. When this captures most of what we need for basic physics, it might be that this is not the only way we want to go in. So here's Riemann's ODE. You have this somewhat complicated looking ODE. All solutions can be expressed in this single function, the hypergeometric function 2f1, that has singular points only at 0, 1, and infinity. So the relation between this general f here and the hypergeometric function is kind of like the modified Bessel function versus Bessel function, if you're familiar with that. Symbolic manipulation software can easily translate one into the other. If you want to solve this complicated equation, it's enough to just solve this simpler equation and have some simple factors in front. Here's the simpler equation. So if I tell you something is hypergeometric, it has three regular singularities by definition, then you can always transform it to this equation, which you could call Riemann's OD, but it was studied already by Euler and Gauss. You can use Frobenius method, which just means make a series ansatz, possibly involving fractional exponents. So when you solve recursion relation for the coefficients of this series, you may get fractional numbers, in which case you need to allow for the fractional generalization of n factorial. So this is called 2f1. There are two here and one here, and they're separated by semicolons. So there are two of these a, b, and there's c here is down there. Now, what does it really mean for it to be regular single at infinity? I specify what it means for P and Q for a finite point, but not for infinity. Why is it that this more complicated equation can be expressed in terms of this function that satisfies this simpler equation? And by the way, why didn't Hoyen get to fix the fourth point? So what's special about three points? To be clear, to solve this ODE that might arise in your physical problem, you don't really need to understand the geometry or the big reasons why this is. You just need to be able to apply it. But I think even if you just want to apply it, I think it's useful to think about the geometry. So let's pick a Cartesian grid at the origin. And let's consider Riemann's sphere. So he says complete the plane with a point at infinity, which is the same in every direction. You will have already heard about this in complex analysis. We may not have realized that unlike in the usual case where plus and minus infinity are totally different, in the Riemann sphere, they are the same. They all lead to the North Pole. So if you want a flat grid here, this grid will look funny at the North Pole. We'll see later why this happens. Here's a nice video. Sometimes this is called a dipole. It looks like the electric field of a dipole chart if you're familiar with electromagnetism. Why that is, is not so clear at the moment. Here's a side comment. If shrunk further infinity, this clump here becomes a small clump that's called a gravitational instanton or curvature defect. This is like a topological soliton or instanton in lattices in condensed matter. For example, this paper that gave them the Nobel Prize describes both a vortex in some complicated setting, but also a Burkhardt's vector, which is a defect in a lattice. So these localized lattice defects in applied physics can be described by similar methods to when people talk about complicated things like gravitational instantons. What I'm trying to say here is that even though it looks completely flat down at the South Pole, you can have some localized curvature. What about polar coordinates? So this looks like a source in electromagnetism. We know there's nothing too fun about polar coordinates except that the angle uh, flips discontinuously, for example, at zero. But again, if you're gonna draw these coordinate lines along the sphere, there will be a sink at infinity, meaning this will converge again to a point and these squares get smaller and smaller. The areas of the squares shrink towards infinity, both in the Cartesian and the polar case. So there's something fun happening here with distances, which is something called the metric structure of this space. It's useful to understand this kind of thinking because this is how Riemann thought about these ordinary differential equations. So if we want to understand them better, we should better understand the geometry of what's going on here a little bit. In fact, if we have a mapping between here and here, this mapping could not be both conformal, angle preserving, and area preserving. If it was, it would be an isometry, a mapping that preserves both lengths and angles, but that doesn't exist. In GR, people would say that these are physically different spaces, so you can't just coordinate change between them. But now something's really funny. Riemann says we're going to use the Riemann sphere to describe the complex plane. Here's another way to think about this, the hairy ball theorem. On this page, they define an index, which is how often a vector rotates if you go around a closed curve. The index of a source and a sink is plus one and plus one, so the total is two. The index of a dipole is plus two, so the total is two, and this had to be. So topology constrains the total geometry. If you're not familiar with this, it would be useful maybe to understand some topology to constrain what's going on here. But let's be more explicit. Let's project this Riemann sphere down to the plane. 
There are two ways to do it, either the pole tangent or the equatorial, which is what I will do. So I define the stereographic projection by starting at a north pole, crossing the sphere at a point and hitting a point on the plane, and then mapping it back and forth between these two points. Here's some basic geometry. Go through this if you're interested in the details. It should be easy to see from triangles here that this holds, and then you rearrange it to get that. You do the same for y, you get this relation. These x and y's are actually related simply to usual coordinates on the sphere. This is when projected from the north pole to the sphere to the plane. We could also do the south pole, then we get some other coordinates, x tilde and y tilde. We start from the south pole and we go to the point on the plane. There's some different signs, so you might want to check that you agree with this. And now the claim is we can form complex coordinates and they're mapped to each other in a simple way. W can be expressed like this, x tilde plus i y tilde. If you just write it out in terms of x and y, you get this. And now amazingly, this whole thing here reduces to that. And therefore, this is just the complex conjugate of z divided by absolute value z squared, if you look at the definition of z, and this is just 1 over z. So why were these two equal? Well, it's easier to go the other way. Take these x and y's and compute the sum of the squares. This is easy to see. Using the conjugate rule, you get this relation. So w is just 1 over z, and that's how you get from north to south pole projection. It shouldn't really matter what we label the north or the south pole in a sphere, in fact, we should be able to rotate the sphere however we want when we map it to the plane. So this inversion is apparently an interesting, allowed coordinate transformation. It should be a symmetry of turning the sphere upside down. Once we allow this, we should also allow other linear versions of that. So A, B, C, and D are some in general complex numbers. If this is a symmetry, then what's actually invariant? It turns out the cross ratio. So if you form this combination of these four points, then this is invariant under this transformation. If you want to know more, there's a nice page here. There's a nice discussion in this book by Siegel. But how do we use this? Well, there's something called a Poincaré disk. It can be thought of as the stereographic projection of a hemisphere, and it is a model of non-Euclidean geometry. So you see lengths change between the interior of the disk and the boundary of the disk. And the cross ratio of four points can be used to define distance. To be precise, it's the logarithm of the cross ratio that's distance. What that means for us is that because the cross ratio is invariant under these fractional linear transformations, distance along this line really only depends on one of these four variables. In other words, we can fix three points. Because you can transform from these four variables to this one variable, the cross ratio, you can fix three of these points and vary one of them, and that can control your cross ratio. This is the underlying geometric reason why we can fix three points. By the way, in applied physics, this is also useful, for example, to visualize in three dimensions the diamond lattice. Actually, for calculations, I didn't really say how to calculate distances on the Poincaré disk, but there's another version, the upper half plane, that you can get to by a conformal mapping from the disk that I encourage you to work out yourself. Then you get this line element. Distances in its two-dimensional upper half plane don't depend on the sideways motion, but they do depend on where you are in Y, as I try to indicate here. And this is great. This is simple to compute with. It's just the upper half plane. The line element is simple. So after the ordinary plane and the sphere, this is a useful toy model. It turns out it has negative curvature. So if you know how to compute curvature, you can compute it from this line element using standard methods from general relativity or differential geometry. In fact, this line element can be found by demanding constant curvature minus one or by demanding invariance on the Mobius transformations. You can find geodesics that are analogs of straight lines. You find straight lines up or straight. A semicircle is actually about as straight as you get in the upper half plane. And this is important to Poincaré when you consider this for, as a model for non-Euclidean geometry and study Euclid's parallel axiom. Now back to the hypergeometric bucket. We want to take a lot of special functions from mathematical physics and bunch them into this hypergeometric function. Riemann says you get to pick zero, one, and infinity on the Riemann sphere as your singular points, which was this. So with this OD, infinity here means go to the W coordinate where infinity is zero. So the statement about infinity here was transform this OD to the W coordinate. There's another solution that's linearly independent, has many relations to F with other arguments. Now I'll do some taxonomy. I'll talk about special cases and examples. Some of you may not find that so interesting, in which case you can skip to the end of this video. First of all, the two and one mean two upstairs and one downstairs. So the generalization is we have more of these upstairs and more downstairs. The series truncates if A or B are non-positive integers. For example, the genre polynomials arise as F21 like this, and Chebyshe polynomials arise like this. So this already captures a lot about how we usually solve ODEs, but not just polynomials. Now we have examples like one over one minus Z to the A, where A is some number. We have log, we have arc sine. So we capture a lot of elementary things by this single function. Of course, the idea that you know what a function looks like stops with this, because these functions don't look anything like each other, and they're captured by the same function. 
course, if it was only a bucket of old functions, it would be boring. But these are some new functions that you may not be familiar with. The elliptic integral is this integral. It's a hypergeometric function. It has a friend called the Jacobi theta function. And the relation is like this, where the relation between q and k is this. And you might say, why on earth do I care about this function? In fact, it's a very basic thing in mathematics. The sine gives the arc length of a circle, and the elliptic integral k gives the arc length of an ellipse. This is relevant even for the most basic question of swing of a pendulum. If you don't use the small angle approximation to describe pendulum motion, the period time is not exactly this, but it's this. They deviate depending on the angle. You also see, well, it's not that much. If you had a pendulum of one meter length that went up to 10 degrees, the error you get would only be a fifth of a percent. So this is a very good approximation for most small angles, as expected. But this is an interesting generalization. And here's another interesting generalization. Legendre polynomials are very important, as we discussed earlier. You just have one integer index. You can go to associated Legendre polynomials with two integers, or you can go to the Legendre function that depends on two numbers mu and nu. They're not necessarily integers. And this captures a lot more than this original function, which is a special case of this one. And of course, this all falls in the F21 bucket. More concretely, here's the relation. And I like this NIST site. There are many other sites. So one example is spherical harmonics, very popular in physics, for example, in quantum mechanics or in electromagnetism. They're expressed in the two variable Legendre polynomials. They arise from the angular OD for the Laplace equation in spherical coordinates using separation of variables. So this is some very basic special function. You get these colorings, you can rotate them sideways to see a little bit more what's going on. Notice the first ones don't rotate at all. The m equals zero ones have axial symmetry, and in fact, they're reduced to the original Legendre polynomials. This is all well and good for expanding scalar functions, which we call spin zero in physics. But what if we want spin one half for fermions or vectors? We might want spin one or gravitational waves for that matter. As for many other things, already Jacobi essentially solved that problem. So the Jacobi polynomials are these special cases of hypergeometric functions. You can use them to build the Wigner's D matrix, where D is for Darstellung, representation in German. So this is very important in representation theory. This is a generalization of spherical harmonics to other spins. You could even do five dimensions. So this is a five dimensional space that was discussed in my former student Stefan's PhD thesis. He wants to do two tensor harmonics on this five dimensional T11 space. But if you want to do something simpler like vector harmonics on the two sphere, it's often a good idea to read what people did who had to solve a harder problem and see how they deal with the easier problem. So he has a nice appendix on that. Here's another function, the poly logarithm. It's defined with not just two one, but other numbers here. This is important in statistical physics. It's the Fermi-Boson boson distribution function, and it's given by an integral like this. It's relevant in condensed matter physics. People spend a lot of time measuring and studying Fermi surfaces. Then a simple example are deviations from this simple polylogarithm description. Here's an example of polylogarithm. It's a logarithm. If you're used to sums, you might recognize this sum for z equals one as being the Riemann zeta function. This function has many uses in physics. It's a Mellon transform of Jacobi theta function, which is in itself a heat kernel, meaning it's a Green's function or Fermi kernel of the heat equation. In number theory, the Riemann zeta function is the Dirichlet series for the theta function, which can be thought of as essentially the same statement as the one above. Even if you didn't know about zeta, you should be familiar with this kind of sum. So this looks okay, but this looks pretty bad. So zeta at one is this divergent sum. Now people claim if you look it up, this. How can this be true? The sum of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 is minus 1 12th. What does that mean? This is well understood, but there are a lot of interesting mysteries about the theta function. For example, find all the zeros, you get a million dollars. Why number theorists are interested, here's an excerpt from Riemann's paper where he founded analytic number theory. His function has some relationship with the distribution of primes, primzahlen. And there's a beautiful animation here. We see prime numbers appear as lines in darkness by analyzing these expressions. So back to the polar logarithm, I said this is closely related to the Riemann zeta function. And in fact, the zeta function, as we said, has a polar s equals 1, but the polar logarithm does not. Except if z equals 1, we can go back to this problem. So what we have done is we give some kind of continuation of this infinity to a finite function as long as z is not 1. Hypergeometric functions also appear in Feynman diagrams. This is the Klein-Gordon equation. This is the Green's function. This is the propagator. And they can compute a loop diagram. And we do this, you find this, which can be expressed in this Lash function, that is the generalization of both the polar logarithm and the Riemann zeta function. An example of something similar, the Green's function of the Klein-Gordon equation on the four sphere describes the sitter space, our universe. We had a lot of examples now. Equal important is that hypergeometric function provides unified description of a lot of different things. The underlying idea is analytic continuation. Riemann said 
let's consider f of z. But the Cauchy-Riemann equations are very rigid. It's a systematic way to handle poles, like we saw. So we can go another step and let two of the singularities flow together and get a confluent hypergeometric function. It's a little simpler looking, has this integral representation that can be useful. And it captures a lot of interesting special functions, like the Bessel function is this, the Hermite function is this, the error function is useful for normal distribution errors, like in signal processing, and has a relationship to the incomplete gamma function, like this. There's a digamma and the polygamma functions can be expressed in terms of the gamma function. They have simple representations, logarithmic derivative of the gamma function. And finally, what was the relationship now with hypergeometric? Well, gamma and Riemann zeta are closely related, like this. So the log of gamma can be expanded with coefficients that are Riemann zeta. This is the end of my taxonomy. Now a few remarks about generalizations. So we said the inversion problem for the circle is solved by the sine function. The height here is the sine. What about another curve like the lemniscus? curve? As shown in these nice notes, you can manipulate the distances here such that you get this integral. And this can be solved in terms of the Weierstrass elliptic function. Weierstrass, two students, Frobenius and Fuchs, you've already heard about. And here's his own elliptic function that has its own code in tech called Weierstrass handwriting, which is pretty cool. Closely related is the Jacobi theta function. Essentially, this is the logarithmic double derivative of this. These functions have a lot of applications in mathematics and physics. We also don't want to do just ODEs. We want to transition. So we introduce a parameter, which is like the tau in Weierstrass function. And theta function satisfies the heat equation because this parameter tau is now interpreted as time you actually have driven with respect to it that you did not in Weierstrass ODE. So this is a nice way to, in a very controlled setting, transition from an ODE, where tau is a parameter, to a PD, where tau is a variable. In fact, a nice question you can ask in this context, which is difficult to ask otherwise, is what happens when time in the heat equation goes to zero? There should be a delta function from the theta function. But in fact, it depends which direction the tau goes to zero. So if you imagine part of tau goes to zero, then this variable Q here goes to one, and that's captured by the boundary of this disk. The curling here shows you that depending on which direction you go in, you will get different answers, whether it's infinity or zero. It gets more and more interesting for higher arguments. Just plotting solutions to the heat equation in some limit looks strangely familiar. In fact, it's the Poincaré disk. Escher drew this a lot, has some beautiful pictures, for example, on this page. You see that these demons get more and more packed as you go to the boundary. This shows you that the distances on the Poincaré disk are not the same as distances on the usual plane disk. What does this have to do with physics? The area of those in infinitesimal annuli increases as you go to infinity. This is, of course, used in the Maxwell equations for waveguides, antennas, fiber optics. The simple solution here for the radial function is the Bessel function. We've seen that this fits into our bucket, and a generalization from trigonometric to elliptic to automorphic was given by Poincaré. In this discussion, Bessel functions are a useful tool. For more on this, check out this new book by some friends of mine. They explain, for example, what it means to be holomorphic in this context. You can have a complex structure. In general, you may not be able to preserve this beautiful structure of the complex geometry. But there's still a way forward, and Poincaré blazed this path. In fact, the Poincaré disk, once we accept that it has constant negative curvature, we can have done a projection from a hyperboloid instead of the sphere. You get the Lorentz group this way, as is discussed in great detail on the Wikipedia page about the Poincaré disk. You can go even further and say I can form a homogeneous space by forming equivalence classes in this Lorentz group that gives me anti de Sitter space, which is used nowadays for the so-called hyperbolic Kyle approximation or the anti de Sitter space conformal field theory correspondence. Thanks for watching.